I was so excited to learn Biblical Greek. I bought every Greek text and Greek help I could get my hands on. Even after I graduated Fuller Seminary in 1987, I kept buying the newest Greek helps and texts. This is my Nestle's 27th edition Greek New Testament. It's edited by people like um, Kurt and Barbara Alland and Jesuit Carlo Maria Martini and the famous Bruce Metzger. This is the Greek text that determines almost every single translation of the New Testament done in the world today, whether Roman Catholic, Orthodox, Protestant, or Baptist. No translator working with the United Bible Societies, Wycliffe Bible Translators, Summer Institute of Linguistics, or any other of hundreds of groups was allowed to use any other than this official text. That is, until the Nestles 28 came out. This is the Gospel of Mark. I've done some coloring here. Take, take a look at these pages. You see all these orange spots? That's about every place an important textual reading is found from just one source. Greek Codex 2427. It's rated Category 1. I'll explain that in a minute. But it was considered so important that it could never be ignored for any change in a word, phrase, or verse of the Gospel of Mark. So why am I telling you about all this? Because it's a fake. What does this fake codex have to do with Sinaiticus? Its story teaches us specific lessons about how to detect a forgery. And Sinaiticus, well, want to hear more? Hi, I'm David Daniels from Chick Publications. As I said, uh, Codex 2427 was rated Category 1. Here is the description straight from uh, Kurt and Barbara Aland in their textbook on textual criticism, the text of the New Testament. Category 1. Manuscripts of a very special quality, which should always be considered in establishing the original text. For instance, the Alexandrian text belongs here. The papyri and unseals up to the 3rd or 4th century belong here almost automatically because they represent the text of the early period. So, according to Kurt and Barbara Allen, if it's Alexandrian text or if it was dated by someone as being 3rd or 4th century, it's almost always called Category 1. In fact, look at that. There's the last page of 2427 right there in the book across from Category 1. Codex 2427 is a tiny codex. It has only the Gospel of Mark, along with little painted illustrations. So here's a quick look at 2427. You see those letters? They're lowercased, so it's called a minuscule. Here's where it's get, it gets interesting. It's dated as the 14th century, 1300s, and yet it's category one. Why is a 1300s test, text supposedly one of the best? Because it's almost completely the same as the text of the codex. Vaticanus. You know, the one that along with Sinaiticus 
is used to make almost all the changes in modern Bibles. Vaticanus is an Alexandrian text. An Alexandrian text is category 1, so 2427 is also category 1. My professor's professor, Ernest Cadman Colwell, gave 2427 its other name. He called it Archaic Mark. As in oldest and best, he said it preserved a primitive text of the Gospel of Mark. Here he is with Edgar Goodspeed. Goodspeed made his own New Testament and Apocrypha. And he's the guy who acquired 2427 for the University of Chicago. In fact, for all I know, that might be a transcript of 2427 between the two of them. So to the text scholars, it seemed like some scribe in the 1300s AD had a copy of Mark that was almost identical to Mark in Vaticanus. Then he copied it down, but this Mark was completely different from the text of other Bibles in those days. So, Caldwell, Edgar Goodspeed, Kearsop and Silva Lake, those were the photographers of Sinaiticus in 1910, and Kurt and Barbara Alland all brought, or they bought into Minuscule Codex 2427. People were saying it might be the closest thing to the original Gospel of Mark. Now, everyone knows that every manuscript is a copy of something. But of what? Professor Caldwell wondered about that, but he never figured it out. A few people suspected it was possibly a fake. Caldwell said, quote, everything about 2427 is wrong. But you saw my Greek New Testament. Thinking it was fake didn't stop their agenda. They said it was one of the most important witnesses to the original Gospel of Mark. I mean, look at this. It influenced their textual decisions for years. But think about it. This codex of the Gospel of Mark had something for everyone. For paleographers, ancient writing experts, it had unusual handwriting. It was sloppy and inconsistent. The experts couldn't figure out what century it belonged in, from the 1300s to the 1700s. For art history students, it had illuminations. That means paintings that illustrate the gospel story. For text critics, it had words that were like Vaticanus, as well as words that were strangely different, and even three sets of missing words that were baffling. I'll get back to that. But no one could prove if 2427 was genuine or a fake. Until 1989, when a chemistry professor named Mary Virginia Orna noticed that archaic Mark had a lot of iron blue or Prussian blue. She did tests on it and she proved it was so Prussian blue. Why does that matter? Because Prussian blue was not around in the 1300s. It was invented in 1704 and was not available for sale until the 1720s. So 2427 could not be from the 1300s. It would have to be after 1720, but there's more. No one could prove where it came from, called its provenance, before it was found in the collection of a Byzantine collector in Athens, Greece, after he died in 1917. But there was more. In 2006, Margaret Mitchell of the University of Chicago made high-resolution digital photos available online for the first time. 
then regular people could look at the codex and try to figure out its mysteries. A few years later, she asked Abigail Quant, an expert in rare books and preservation, to restore and analyze 2427 and send it out to be tested. These are the results. Number one, the Prussian blue is not a later touch-up. Nobody retouched the manuscript. So the codex had to be made after 1704. Two, they also found synthetic ultramarine blue. It was only made available as a pigment since the 1820s. So the codex had to be made after 1820. Three, but the white was a zinc white. So it had to be made after 1825. Four, but then they found another pigment that was made by a special process, but not until 1874. So our 1300s miraculous witness to the Vaticanus was actually made when? After 1874. So much for oldest and best. Okay, but wait. What if they found a really ancient manuscript and copied it? Wouldn't that be the same as if it were made in 1300? Isn't a copy of an ancient copy of Mark just as good as an ancient copy? Then we gotta find what 2427 is a copy of. That's where Stefan Carlson comes in. Carlson had been working on another supposed copy of Mark. He wanted a careful analysis of 2427. Back in the summer of 2005, he found out Margaret Mitchell had put the whole thing online, so he went to work. As he did, ultimately he found three verses of Mark, 6-2, 811 and 1414 where there were so many words missing that it looked like the writer accidentally skipped a whole line of text three times while copying but it wasn't short lines like in the Vaticanus it was wide lines like in a modern printed book he thought if he could find a book with those exact missing words from 2427 on one line of text, that would prove his theory and show him which book the writer copied. Vaticanus didn't work. Too few words on a line. Westcott and Hort's text didn't work. Tischendorf's seventh and eighth editions of the Greek New Testament didn't work. <sighs> Where was that book? And when was it made? He went through Washington, D.C. libraries, checking critical editions like Lachmann's and the Jesuit Cardinal Mines, but no luck. In 2006, he wrote the missing words on note cards, and he checked Bibles in Jesuit Georgetown University and in the Library of Congress. Nothing. Finally, he went to the Catholic University of America. He went through about a dozen Bibles, and then... He hit pay dirt. He found out it was this particular edition of the Greek New Testament by Philip Bootman. Here's what happened. Jesuit Cardinal Angelo Mai had control over the Vaticanus for many years. He kept Tischendorf and Tregellus from seeing it as much as possible while he prepared his own edition for publication. It came out in 1857 and 1859. It was close, but Mai made a number of mistakes. One guy duplicated those mistakes. He had never seen the actual Vaticanus, so he couldn't know. That man was Philip Bootman. He copied Mai's errors into his copy of Mark. But he was a scholar, so he couldn't stop there. He also had about 85 other personal choices for the text that didn't read like either my or the Vaticanus in Mark. Then he published his Greek New Testament in 1860. 
he probably rushed it to be first. But in 1867, Tischendorf's Vaticanus came out, and it was way better than, than mine, and nobody wanted Bootman's mistakes, so they bought Tischendorf's Vaticanus. Bootman's New Testament was going into the trash can of history. Except that sometime between 1874 and 1917, an enterprising forger grabbed Bootman's copy to make his fake, ancient Gospel of Mark. We know that because he not only repeated Cardinal Mai's mistakes, he also copied 81 of Bootman's 85 personal choices for the text of Mark as well. And no other manuscript in the world has those mistakes, plus those personal choices. And of course, his lines matched the three omissions of words in 2427. Let me just take Mark 1414. 14. Here it is. This is right out of Bootman. See right here? Auto kai hapu an eselthe. And then there's a whole line here in yellow. And then it says tokatalumamu. Now this whole line, all these words, are exactly what's missing where that line is. The words I read to you, right up to this line, come right up to here. And the words of the next line, takatalumamu, and then on from there, start right there. And guess what? It's true on all three sets of missing words. It was settled. But you know, no one had to trust the 2427 in the first place if they had followed a couple of basic rules. One, provenance. Where did it come from? What was it like then? How do you know? Can you prove it? Two, chain of custody. Prove the evidence wasn't tampered with. Where did it go? Who had it? Can you prove it? You want to know that what you have now is what they had then. So, provenance, chain of custody, and chemical tests and checking which manuscript they copied. Guess how many of these rules they followed for Sinaiticus? Zero. No testing. I told you how they canceled the April 25th, uh, sorry, the April 2015 tests. Codex Sinaiticus remains untested. No master copy. We have never found a text that is like the Sinaiticus. Vaticanus may be the closest, but it has thousands of differences. No provenance. Remember, despite all the stories they make up about ancient catalogs and places where it's been, they're all made up out of whole cloth. The first time anyone ever is documented seeing the Sinaiticus or any part of it is 1844, with the parts that were sent to Frederick of Saxony. Then, 1845, when we know Porphyry Uspensky saw everything else, that Tischendorf later took from there in 1859, and maybe a bit more. No chain of custody. Only a few people ever even claimed to witness when Tischendorf had the Sinaiticus, and they said he changed it and aged it to make it look older. Imagine that. Did I mention that I don't trust the Sinaiticus at all? So what can you prove about the Sinaiticus? It's almost like someone created the text out of the air to give textual critics and paleographers something to analyze for years on end and make them hunger to compare it with Vaticanus. There's no proof of provenance with Sinaiticus. It's almost poof provenance, as Stephen Avery says. But with the preserved Bible, proving provenance is easy. There are thousands of copies that were found all over the ancient world. 
just like Jesus said in Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And those copies are so close to each other that they're designated by a single letter, the letter M for majority. Yeah, there are small differences, of course, but those were dealt with centuries ago. Modern scholars hate the preserved Antiochian stream of Bible texts with a passion. There are over 1,200 minuscules alone that represent the majority text, but you won't see them listed in a critical Greek text. According to Kurt and Barbara Aland, these were omitted to restrict the lists to manuscripts with a significance for textual criticism. In other words, they won't have a job if all they have are the preserved texts to work with. They need major differences. But we don't. All we need are God's words, preserved through the chain of custody of faithful Bible believers, translated perfectly into our language. In English, it's the King James Bible. When somebody tries to say their Bible is better, I just say, please, prove it. God bless you, and have a wonderful day.